currently professor of medicine at the University of Carolina, Chapel Hill, and director of geriatric oncology at the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. His major research interests are breast cancer with emphasis on the treatment of older women, issues related to treatment of all older cancer patients, and providing education in geriatrics to fellows in training. Dr. Moss is currently co-chair of the Cancer and the Elderly Committee for the Alliance, a National Cancer Institute-sponsored cooperative group which endeavors to increase awareness and clinical trials, clinical trial opportunities for older patients. Dr. Trevor Jolly is an assistant pro professor in the UNC Department of Medicine, Division of Geriatric Medicine and Hematology Oncology, and care provider in the Geriatric Oncology Specialty Clinic. He earned his medical degree from the University of the West Indies, Trinidad, and completed sub subspecialty training at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and UNC Chapel Hill. He is a prior Ruth Kirstein National Service Research Award appointee and the current Hartford Center of Excellence in Geriatric Medicine Scholar. His research focuses on the value of geriatric assessment to guide interventions and treatment decisions in older adults with cancer. He has collaborated on several studies which incorporate a concise geriatric assessment and was involved in the conduct of preliminary research that established the feasibility of geriatric assessment in a busy multidisciplinary tertiary referral cancer center. <laughs> 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 Whoa. A lot of <laughs> Remind me to shorten that next time. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was a very wonderful introduction. I'm sorry for all the words. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for coming um, to this uh, presentation. And I hope you guys have been having a great day so far. Um, I just wanted you guys to know that it's really not age. It's really not age. It's not about age. There was a woman here a little while ago. And the talk, as, it, as it's described on your, um, on your agenda, says for uh, women over 50. And she, she saw that, and she noticed that we changed it to older women, she, and she's like, well, I'm 50, I'm not old. And it's really not age. And so this, is, uh, this will be a good kind of start off point to, you know, why, why are we actually having this talk? When I was preparing for this talk, I asked myself, why, why should we have a talk about older women with metastatic breast cancer? What is different about older women with metastatic breast cancer uh, compared to younger women? Well, first of all, Older women with, or as I would like to say, more mature women with metastatic breast cancer um, are the majority of patients with breast cancer. So this is some data on the incidence of breast cancer with distant involvement, otherwise known as metastatic breast cancer. And as you can see, women in that age group represent the majority as opposed to younger women. Now this data does not include people who had breast cancer before and develop metastatic disease from recurrences. This only includes newly metastatic disease. Um, so the, the numbers here are underrepresented. So it's actually probably greater than, than what I'm showing you here, the incidence that is. And so this is kind of what I was getting at when I said it's not age. So this, uh, this, this bar graph represents women at different ages. So 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. And it shows their estimated life expectancy. And this is based on, um, on data that was published in JAMA. And you can see here that if you're 70 years old and in good health, you have an additional 21 years uh, of life, uh, estimated life expectancy. And if you're in poor health, you only have nine years. And coming up to the older end of the spectrum here, if you're 95 years and you're in good health, about five years, an additional one year if you're in poor health. And that has uh, implications for the treatment of, of cancers. Um, one of the most important questions that you have to ask uh, when you're considering treating cancer is, 
will the patient be able to tolerate the therapy and will they live long enough to, 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 to benefit from the therapy, okay? So a 90-year-old woman with a, a very favorable breast cancer, you would have to consider your treatment options very carefully as opposed to somebody who is younger and so forth. As we get older, we develop more problems in life, so more comorbidities. And so this graph shows the uh, prevalence of overall comorbidities by severity across the age spectrum, so from 20 to 100 years. And so as you get older, the, the actual number of comorbidities represented by these different colors, so mild, moderate, and severe, increases exponentially. And so whenever patients come into the clinic, you know, we are understandably worried about the cancer, but we're also worried about the other problems, which frequently, and I'll show you data to support this, are not really taken into considerations, consideration. So this just shows the kind of comorbidities that older women tend to experience. So this again is age um, on the horizontal axis here going from 20 to 100 and things like dementia, heart failure, prior cancers, HIV is the only one that goes down, diabetes, hypertension, all of those things increase with age and need to be factored in when you're considering treatment options. Can I ask a sure. Uh, so comorbidity is kind of any medical illness, really, um, and it could include your cancer. So cancer is a comorbid illness. Thank you. Sure. And so this is kind of a data that was gathered from a study that we did, um, looking at um, problems that are not routinely evaluated on a routine physical examination. So these are all measures of various things. So measures of function, measures of cognitive impairment, measures of your ability to perform activities of daily living. So, you know, going grocery shopping, uh, answering the phone, getting to your medical appointments, financial management, and so forth. Activities of daily living, simple things like getting to the bathroom, getting your clothes on, um, you know, getting dressed in the morning, getting out of bed, falls. Uh, we just had a patient, I'm on, currently on the inpatient service, who had cancer and is now in a nursing home and is unable to move any of her extremities because she fell and fractured her neck. Um, and that, again, has implications for her treatment going forward. But more importantly, you know, could this have been avoided by considering that up front had she had you know, functional impairments to start with um, that could have required modification of her therapy that could have avoided this, this unfortunate complication. Medicines that can have side effects um, and can also interact and cause other problems. And then we talked about the comorbidities. And what we found is these regular bars here represent what happened at a major academic center, and these kind of shaded bars here represent what happens in the community. And across the board, in both the community and in the academic medical centers, we saw significant amounts of functional impairment, cognitive impairment, impairments and ability to perform activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, falls, polypharmacy, so having a lot of medications that are likely to interact, and comorbidity, okay? And these are things that would not be included in a routine kind of history and physical examination. So how do we assess older um, adults uh, with cancer? So historically, the oncologists consider things like the chronological age, the Kronowski's performance status, and the Eastern, Corporate, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group performance status. And so performance status is a measure of how you're able to function in life. The problem is with performance status is that it's not very granular. So we just, um, it's in publication now, but we just submitted a paper showing that even people with normal performance status, when your doctor looks at you and says, this person is functioning well, have significant amounts of problems with falls, comorbidity, uh, cognitive impairment, <coughs> functional impairment, and so forth. And so these factors really need to be identified and uh, taken into consideration and addressed uh, by interventions, you know, as part of a comprehensive cancer treatment program. Geriatricians, which I am one of, uh, uh, conversely, evaluate or assess older adults 
by looking at those things, functional status, comorbid medical conditions, concomitant medications, cognitive function, psychological state, and looking at social support. For example, could that patient who fell have, could we have avoided that fall by kind of having somebody to help her, you know, get to the bathroom? She fell in the bathroom or on her way to the bathroom. So those are important things that we need to consider. Um, and so this is kind of what I do for a living. It's called a geriatric assessment. And, you know, I hate to use the word geriatric assessment. I think of it as a health assessment for, for anybody, right? Because that's, that's what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything special. The only thing that I'm doing is asking. I'm asking questions that perhaps a busy clinician or an oncologist doesn't have time to ask. So can you get to the bathroom? You know, do you need help with those issues? Um, the problem is, is that I'm a geriatrician. There are about, what, 4,000 of us in the United States now. The population is aging, and Dr. Musk will show you some of that data. The number of people who do what I do is actually going down, okay? so. If you look at the time it takes now to get an appointment in the regular geriatrics clinic, it's about three months if you go into the front door. If you call me and I call somebody else and say, well, can you get this person in? They really need help. You might get in faster, but it takes about three months. So we have a diminishing supply of geriatricians, right? We have an aging population. And so who is going to take care of the aging population? We have to learn to do this ourselves. So the, the physicians who manage cancer patients need to learn how to do this. And there are several initiatives and programs at UNC looking at training subspecialists in caring for older, older patients who have these, these problems, okay? So what are the benefits of this assessment? One, as I showed you, it can uncover problems that are not detected on a routine history and physical and a routine clinical e evaluation. It can predict things like chemotherapy toxicity, and Dr. Muss is going to show you some of that data, morbidity, and it can actually predict survival. So how well are you going to do? That first chart that I showed you, how do you estimate survival? And the geriatric assessment can predict some of those things. It can lead to interventions, you know, as I've been alluding to, that improve function, that improve nutrition, mental health, and social support. So if you don't know that somebody needs help, how are you going to help them? And that's when I was looking at a talk, I said, you know, the talk is listed as addressing the needs of women over 50. Well, if we don't know what their needs are, how are we going to address them? Okay? So, and there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that uh, this improves their overall outcome. So it, it's been shown clearly and documented that just doing this assessment, identifying these problems, and, 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 um, and intervening on them can actually reduce uh, things like early hospitalization, improve mood, and even improve survival. And that data is, is, is maturing. Um, and the challenges, as I mentioned, is that it requires time. It requires specialized personnel and expertise, which a lot of, of uh, physicians don't have. And I'm not saying that to, to, to knock them. I'm just saying that because it's true. So the number of doctors with geriatric certification is going down. It's not going up. And there are insufficient number of geriatricians to do it, like myself. So we, you know, doctors and patients really need to, to advocate for more people doing this and being trained to, to detect these problems. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So it's, it's the, the one that I use is, is divided into two parts. A simple test where I ask the patient to sit down, walk 10 feet, walk back, and I time you. And based on the speed that you can do that, and it, gives, it provides a lot of information. Gait speed actually is a predictor of, of, of survival. If it takes you like two days to walk 10 meters, then you're in, you're in bad shape, okay? Um, we still use the KPS. We, do, we evaluate your memory, and um, we, we weigh you. And, you know, things like weight loss are very poor uh, uh, prognostic factors in older cancer patients. And now this assessment is predominantly self-administered, so all of these things is actually done by the patient. So they kind of assess, they self-assess their own hearing, their own vision. Um, you know, again, for that patient who fell, visual impairment is a major problem. Hearing impairment. Um, this is a measure of uh, anxiety and depression and so forth. And, you know, in a busy clinic, things take time. But in this, with this particular measure, it only takes about 10 minutes of the doctor's time. 
10 minutes or of the health professional's time. We do this in the community, the nurses do it. And they do a lot of it and they do well at it. And I'll show you some of that data. They actually do better than we do at UNC. So, and the patient, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes of your time. And this is the data that I was talking about. So most of the people are able to complete the professional portion because that's, you know, that's kind of what is required. You kind of need that as the first step. But if you look down here, this is in the community, 98%, almost 100% of them completed the entire assessment, including the self-reported uh, portion. At UNC, it was only about 82%. And the reason why is because in the community, they actually had somebody sit there with them and actually do it. So they had the help that they needed to do it, and they got it done. And it, the satisfaction was very high in both groups. And so this is kind of the take-home message. If you're in, in good health and in good shape, based on the assessment, you should kind of get standard treatment. Okay? If problems are identified based on the assessment, we should intervene on those to try to get you back in good shape. If you're frail, again, try, to try these interventions and then um, adapt treatment or consider palliation. So dose reductions or you know, dose alterations, dose delays, less frequency, and so forth. And if you're too sick uh, to tolerate therapy, probably consider uh, palliative therapy. And so I just wanted to end on, 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 on data that I was telling you about. At a major academic center, we recently looked into whether or not things like falls could be detected. And out of about 70 patients, only two patients had any documentation. So we know that they <coughs> fell, right? Because they reported them on our assessment. And then we looked into the patient's chart and see, to see if the doctors actually know that they fell. And only about 2% of patients actually had, or I think it was actually two patients, had any documentation of that. Um, and and a very few had anything done about it. And so those are major problems. And if they are left unaddressed, those could be, lead to major problems go, even going through treatment and for quality of life and overall affect the patient's outcome. So I'm going to end there and let Dr. Musk talk about um, the rest. This is just to show that all of this data or some of this data that I showed you is not all me. And there are very um, important people in there, including the Cancer Center Director and myself. Dr. Busby White is the Division Director, and I thank you for your attention. So we could, we could take some questions now, or we could do the whole thing and leave a lot of time. And the other thing, uh, Trevor wrote a great review uh, in, in a journal called uh, Women's Health. It's a really great journal, and I'll pass some of these out. And if you don't get one and you want one, we will print some more out. So it's a review of metastatic breast cancer in older women. Um, so, thanks. So, um, my name is Hi Mus, and I'm a medical oncologist, um, an older medical oncologist. <laughs> and um, in my life, I've done uh, m treated many types of cancer. When I started, there were no specialists in the <laughs> cancer sites, um, and spent many years in breast cancer, and then more recently, really have focused a lot of our career on older women Sorry, that's me. <laughs> with breast cancer. I better grab it. Yeah. So, first I want to say it's, it's, it's really a tribute to all of you to come to this conference, you know, to learn new things and perhaps to advocate um, to our congressmen, to our government, you know, the, dr the dramatic needs for research in the United States for funding, which we'll talk about at the end of the day. Um, but we really need so much more money for funding, but basic research, clinical trials, and then, you know, one of the great tragedies is we have a lot of people that we have good treatment for, and we don't have ac they don't have access. They can't get it, um, even in the United States. So um, you really have a lot you can do, and uh, thank you for coming, and it's really been a privilege for UNC to host this conference. Um, the turnout is spectacular. So uh, Mick Jagger, great philosopher, and he's 70 now, um, and he got this right. Uh, drag it is getting old, but uh, cancer, uh, it, it, a lot of people don't appreciate it, is a disease of aging. 
And so when you watch TV uh, and you see like Stand Up to Cancer, everybody's from Hollywood. They're 30 years old. They're all starved to perfection. It's, it's really not true. It's not true. This is the, cur the incidence curve, red, and the mortality curve for breast cancer in the United States. So incidence is the number of new patients per 100,000, and the same with mortality. So um, if you look here, uh, you know, if it stand up to cancer, the incidence of breast cancer is like 25 women in 100,000 women in this Hollywood age group. And you get up here in the United States, and what happens is in the 70s, it's almost 250 to 300 women per 100,000. So the chances of getting breast cancer dramatically go up with age. And the, the reason there are so many uh, younger women at this conference is um, there are less women in their 70s in the United States than women in their 50s. But as we get older, the, the risks of cancer go up. Now this is breast cancer. The average age is 61 in the U.S. now. So what's happening is we're getting an older population, so there's going to be more breast cancer patients because it goes up with age and there's going to be many more people in their 60s and 70s uh, as we go along. And, and so this is just the reality of it. The other thing is every other cancer looks like this too. Colon cancer, prostate cancer, acute leukemia, they all look like this also. So the average age of colon cancer in the United States is 67 of lung cancer is 68. All cancers look like this. This is what a curve looks like. So this is a national emergency to take care of patients. Now what's the goal of treating an older patient with metastatic breast cancer? It's really the same as any other patient, but first you want to control symptoms if a patient has metastatic cancer, whether it be breast or any type. You want to control symptoms, bone pain, shortness, whatever it is. Uh, and next, you want to maintain function and independence. Now, you may not think of this if you're a younger patient, although you probably do, but if you're an older patient in the community with metastatic breast cancer and you're barely hanging on, the worst thing you want is to get a peripheral neuropathy from Taxol and end up in assisted living. Um, and that's stuff we frequently don't look at because Unfortunately, as Patty and others know who have come to many of our meetings, it's very hard getting older people onto clinical trials. It's not hard uh, because they refuse. It's hard because we don't ask them. And I'll show you some of our data uh, and how you can help. And then lastly, um, we want to control the cancer, obviously. We want to shrink the tumor if it's causing symptoms. Um, but the other thing is, um, if you are a patient with metastatic breast cancer, and you are doing very well, and it's not causing you many symptoms, or they're minimal. If we could freeze you in time and keep that cancer just the way it is, it would be fine, right? It would be fine. So you don't always have to shrink everything, especially if it's associated with extensive toxicity. Um, if you could keep something in place for a while, it's not bad. And in clinical trials, we frequently uh, have three categories for tumor response. One is complete response where all the tumor goes away. And that's very unusual to see in any cancer, uh, except for potentially curable cancers like some lymphomas. But you don't see it in colorectal cancer and breast cancer. Uh, we have a partial response where the tumor's got to shrink about 30% when we measure it. Um, why 30%? It, it's consensus. Obviously, if it shrinks 29%, that's good. Uh, if it shrinks 2%, it's good. But these are just um, statistics that are probably more meaningful because something 30% is not likely to be a measurement error. And then what we have something very important is called a clinical benefit response. So that's where we keep the tumor from growing. It kind of stays the same, the p but it doesn't grow at all. And sometimes they can last a long time. So a clinical benefit response means the tumor stays the same for about six months. And that's recognized now by uh, the FDA and other things as something really good. Um, and, and it would be great to make cancer a chronic disease now by taking everybody at this conference and freezing you in time. That probably would, there are some people here that would not be a good deal for. But for many people, that would be all right. And that would be a, a very good goal. And this is North Carolina. This is the real goal. So um, even with smoking.
So, so you heard from Dr. Carey today, who is an amazing woman and are, uh, has numerous titles at UNC, but she's been a leader in uh, breast cancer genetics. And Chuck Peru and others uh, at UNC uh, have really looked differently at breast cancer and defined it in the breast cancer subtypes. So I, I'm sure Lisa covered this, but let's say you're a patient and you have a estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Probably most people in the audience know what that, that means. Uh, we would think that all those patients would be good candidates for hormonal blocking therapy um, to try to control the cancer for as long as possible. Um, but what we're finding out with these subtypes is that many of the cancers that look like um, they'd probably be easier to treat are hard to treat. They're really, when you look at the genes themselves, they're not going to be very responsive to hormone blocking therapy. And maybe those patients should better be treated with chemotherapy or biologic therapy. So what we've done here is, this is just looking at older people. So we had 802 people from 70 to 93 in the database. And we just wanted to see, is there something unique about the biology of, older can of cancer in older people in these genetic subtypes? And so a normal like means we look in this gene, we look at 40,000 of your genes, and you kind of look just like my genes. So that's very complicated and it's hard to figure out. Um, these are the genes in the cancer. These are not genes like in your blood that you were born with, genes in the cancer. 11% are these HER2 positive uh, breast cancer patients. And those are patients that are very amenable to some of the new treatments. And to me, one of the major advances in metastatic breast cancer in my lifetime has been all the great anti-HER2 directed therapy. We need it for all the other types, but for the HER2 positive patients, there are now patients with met metastases living for years. And a lot of them, their scans look the same as they did five years ago when they were in there, uh, or a little better and they're doing great. And of course, and we love that. We don't know what to do with those patients. We just continue therapy, but it's really a good deal for the patients. And there, there are more and more of them. We have such good drugs. And then we have these luminal A's, ooh, luminal A's and B's, who are the patients who have horn, excuse me. Was it that one? Uh, who are patients who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer and, and a lot of these patients uh, with metastases are going to respond to endocrine therapy and then subsequently chemotherapy and then we have 9% these basal-like cancers who are frequently the triple negative breast cancers that I'm sure was you know, talked about this morning and which are more aggressive tumors. So as you get older your cancers, these luminal A's and B's which are a little less aggressive get to be a little bit more frequent, which is good for older patients, but there's still a lot of bad breast cancers in older people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, which are very serious. Now, what about therapy for met metastatic disease in older patients? Um, it's essentially going to be the same as therapy in younger patients, and so if you're hormone receptor positive, if you're hormone receptor positive, and you're HER2 negative, we would try endocrine therapy. These are drugs that many of you have had, tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, Fazlidex, Megestrol acetate, a whole host of drugs. We would try these agents, and then at some point the cancer is not going to respond anymore to these. But it could be years, and at that time it pays to consider chemotherapy. The HER2 positive patients, um, if they're hormone receptor positive, you can do endocrine therapy with concurrent anti-HER2 therapy, drugs like Herceptin, Pertuzumab, Lapatinib, TDM1. Many of you have, you know, experienced or had these drugs. Uh, or if they're uh, refractory, if the cancer is refractory to endocrine therapy, um, you can go to the anti-HER2 directed therapy with chemotherapy. And some of the best um, results in the metastatic setting are in these patients now. It would be great to figure out, so before anti-HER2 therapy, the worst types of cancers were HER2 positive cancers. And what's happened is we've gotten these great treatments and we've got a multitude of great new drugs for these patients. So they actually do better. 
than a lot of the patients who historically um, we thought should do much better. Um, just like we can cure people with lymphoma, with testis tumor that goes all over their body. Before we had the modern chemotherapy, those patients didn't survive weeks, and now they're cured. Lance Armstrong, an example. Um, and he's just one of many that was cured. So we're trying to find those in breast cancer. It's been elusive, but we're getting close in HER2 positive patients. And then finally, the triple negative patients, where it's really problematic, because in spite of all we know about it, we're desperately trying to find new drugs for clinical trials, new targeted therapy. We're trying to unlock the secret of uh, this, this type of breast cancer. What are the genes that turn it on? Why is it so aggressive? And, and there's good work going on, but we need more of it. And we have a lot of drugs, but we need the money to test the drugs. Um, and as Patty and others, others here can tell you, it's, it's hard getting, you know, we, we constantly take cuts at the national level. Um, even though the cost of x-rays aren't getting cheaper, um, we take a big cut in our clinical trials dollars. Um, for endocrine therapy, if you have a hormone receptor uh, positive tumor, there's a lot of uh, standard agents. Some people can do well for years on these drugs, for years. There are patients, for instance, with bone metastasis that can go on these drugs and have great lives, work every day, um, really uh, do extremely well. And then there's a lot of exciting new things. There's a drug called palbociclib. Some of you may have seen it. A very unique drug that blocks cells from dividing and cycling. So what is cancer? It's, it's cells that do two things that our normal cells don't do. They divide without control, and they're able to spread. So your skin's all dividing, right, all the time. Um, so that's not cancer because it's programmed into the skin to die out on the top layers and fall off, and your skin doesn't spread through your bloodstream into your liver. But cancer cells have that ability to keep growing and destroy those things around them and grow. So that's what cancer is. And so stopping the cancer cells from dividing is very promising. And there's some really good agents, and probably some will be commercially available. And I think this is going to make a big difference in endocrine therapy and maybe, and for metastatic breast cancer, this is endocrine therapy. And it's also going to probably make a big difference in other types of cancer where we haven't looked at it as much, but very exciting. And then there's a lot of immune modulators. You know, we used to think of breast cancer is not really into the immune system. So there's exciting stuff with HER2 positive vaccines. But there's other people looking at other drugs that what they do is um, we probably do have a defect in our immune system when we have metastatic disease. And what we're trying to do is turn on the immune system again to recognize the cancer cells. So some of these new drugs, they're not anti-cancer drugs in that they're not going into the cancer cell and killing some part of that complicated process that's enabling the cancer cells to grow. What these drugs are doing is they're stimulating the immune system to recognize the cancer cells and destroy them. Very clever. You know, for 30 years people have been talking about this, but we finally have drugs. And it's interesting, we're seeing great results. We don't have the breast cancer results yet, but we've got some incredible stuff in melanoma uh, and kidney cancers, cancers that me as a medical oncologist treated for many years, I hardly ever saw anybody respond to chemotherapy. And now there's some very, very exciting data that hopefully we're going to see in breast cancer too. And these studies are being done now. And then some of you have seen other targeted agents. Everolimus is a finitor, and some women here I'm sure have had this drug. It's had, I think, some modest benefit in controlling the cancer. It's kind of, to me, a tougher drug with a lot of bad side effects. Um, and it's uh, expensive. It's very expensive. There are access issues. But th the nice thing about it is uh, the fact that it's available and doing well uh, pushes pharmaceutical companies uh, to invest more money in their research to build better drugs. So um, there's a yin and yang of this. Not a right answer, but um, some exciting things. Um, just focusing back on if we can stop the disease in time, here's a study. Uh, looking at, this is an astrazole, so this is a Rimidex uh, in women with metastatic breast cancer. And this study was done a long time ago. Uh, complete and partial response. So this blue line are patients where the tumor actually shrunk down. 
okay? And here's patients who, where we just kept the tumor from growing. Now, you don't know who they are. You just treat them and nothing happens to all their scans and everything stays the same. And the patients frequently feel really bad. You know, you've got this huge bill for the CAT scan and you feel pretty good and we say, your CAT scan looks the same as it did last time. <laughs> and you guys feel bad, I'll tell you, it's not so bad. If we could freeze it there, it'd be very, very good. As opposed to, to saying, let's give up, put you on a chemotherapy drug that might shrink the tumor a few millimeters and you got really bad side effects. And so it's a very, very delicate balance here. Um, so here are the stable patients and you can see this is uh, overall survival curve. So these curves by being together means there's no difference and you can see a large percentage of these patients like if you went up here on this line from three years and then you move it up here it would tell you that about 70 percent of patients are doing pretty well at three years and they're you know the people whose tumors didn't grow are doing just as well as those that shrunk down. So if you're a person with metastatic breast cancer, older, young, and you're feeling good and your scans are stable, it's not really like all is lost. It's really not like all is lost. Um, many of you have seen, I don't know how many look at scans. You know, my experience is some patients never want to see anything and some people want to see everything. But this is, this is a CAT scan um, and you're kind of, uh, it's like the uh, circus, you know, they're slicing uh, that woman apart in the box. So you're lying on your back and here's your spine, you're lying here, and they sliced you right, let's say, through your belly button. And the, all these little dark spots here, this is your liver, which is a huge organ, um, uh, our um, evidence of where there are cancer cells. This is your spleen, your stomach, that terrible stuff you drink, you know, when you get a CAT scan. And here, here's a great response to treatment. So we can get great shrinkages. Um, but even if we kept it that way, and, that, and the liver has a lot of resiliency in it, um, uh, kept it that way, uh, the patients can do well. But we can do really some really good things with chemotherapy. So why isn't this like Lance Armstrong? Why isn't you know, this killed for good? Well, first of all, these scans, as expensive as they are, they can't see little tiny cancer cells. So we know in breast cancer, even though this looks great, that for most of the women over time, these cancer cells are going to grow back. And the reason for that is you kill a you know, cancer cell the size of a, a cancer, the size of a marble, has a billion cells in it. A billion. So if you kill 99.999%, you still got 10,000 cells left. Those 10,000 cells have been resistant to the drug, and they slowly grow back. So what happens is the drug you've taken, it worked. But now, they killed a lot of the cancer, but what grew back is resistant. Surprisingly, um, you can go to other drugs and do well, and then you can come back to those other drugs a year or two later. And for reasons that I've never quite understood, they can work again. So you can go back to older drugs you've had that worked, not a week later, but a year later, and frequently do very, very well um, with, with treatment. Now, in older patients, we tend to use kindler gentler chemotherapy um, many of you have had uh, capecitabine or Zolota, uh, which to me has been a major uh, drug uh, in the management of metastatic breast cancer because it's oral. You don't lose your hair usually. Your blood counts are good. So unless you get some terrible thing like diarrhea, hand, foot syndrome, it's pretty good quality of life. Um, and uh, we use a lot of that. There are very low doses of drugs that historically have been used. There's weekly taxanes, aribulin. There's a whole list here, and I'm happy to give my slides to anybody uh, here. And a lot of these can work well. There's no ideal order. You think that we should know. Is it better to start with tax? We don't know that. So in older people, and you know, to me it's the same in younger people, but the perception of doctors to younger patients is to be more aggressive. And I'm not always sure that we get it right there. Uh, I think if we explain the issues, some people would say, well, maybe I'll start with, you know, the less toxic drug, even though it may shrink the tumor 5% less, you know, at a time, uh, maybe 5% it's uh, poor, you know, to use the LODA. So I think sometimes we don't do service to our patients 
Uh, but we tend to focus this more on older patients, which is very good. And, um, but for those who, patients where we need to be more aggressive, this is really how I got into uh, geriatric oncology. So this is 92. I was already well along in my career here. <laughs> um, and um, my boss, uh, chief of medicine, a wonderful man, Bill Hazard, said, why don't you look and see how older patients do with breast cancer? So clinical trials previously excluded all older patients from participation. You can't do that now legally, but it's still kind of done uh, maybe not legally, it's done spiritually, where you don't tell the patient about it. <laughs> but it's true. Um, and so we took patients, older patients, we found 70 women. We didn't have a cap on our clinical trials. This was at Wake Forest for age. So we treated anybody. And what we did was we took 70 patients. These were all clinical trials. And in that time, these all contained doxorubicin, adriamycin, very aggressive chemotherapy, which was available in the 90s. What was different then is we didn't do a lot of the adjuvant therapy we did today. Um, we, we tended in the 90s to use adjuvant chemotherapy in mainly high, very high risk patients. And some of the reasons that we're improving overall survival in breast cancer is use, being more aggressive with all types of systemic therapy earlier, but we didn't do it then. Now these are on a clinical trial, so all these older patients had good kidneys and liver function. They were not very sick patients. Uh, and we looked at the aging years. Um, we found that the response rates, and by that I mean the time it took for the tumor to shrink, uh, the, the frequency of tumor shrinkage, was very similar. Now 29% doesn't look as good as 40%, but statistically it's about the same. You know, these are differences are due to chance. The time to treatment, time to tumor progression, how long we kept that tumor from growing again was a little better in the younger women, um, but these numbers likewise were different, and the median survivals here were kind of not very long. These are much sicker patients. In 1992, we didn't have PET scans, didn't have a lot of CT scans. When you had liver metastasis frequently in 1992, you came in with abdominal pain, and you, you know, and we um, felt your liver and we did blood tests. You know, a lot of things have changed, um, much better testing today. So we know a lot about that. We also have learned in older patients that we can use the geriatric assessment as Trevor uh, talked about. So this is a study where we did that assessment and, and we asked older patients who were getting chemotherapy for a whole host of tumors, in addition to the usual things we got out of the chart, we'd ask them questions, have you fallen in the last six months? Do you have hearing impairment? Can, can you walk a block? Do you need help with your medicines? Do you have decreased social activity? Every one of these questions is related to your quality of life and survival. If you have two older women in the community with metastatic breast cancer, and they're both being treated at UNC or Harvard or Duke, and they're getting the identical treatment, and they have METs in identical places, and one person has a great loving family, and they take them to church every Sunday and get them out to the movies, and the other person sits in that place, you know, in a little room with Meals on Wheels showing up once a day, the survival of the patient who is up and about, everything else being equal is better. So in older people, all of these are related to not just your quality of life, but your survival. If you can't walk a block, um, you can't go to the grocery store, someone has to care for you, it's a surrogate of having a lot of other major problems in your life. So um, as Trev said, these are things that you will never find in history and physical, whether it's Harvard or Duke or anywhere you want to go. Uh, generally we don't ask these, and, but what we learned is by making a scoring system, so these are um, the risks of grade three to five chemotherapy toxicity. This is really bad chemotherapy toxicity. Low blood counts, having to go to the hospital for low blood counts and a fever, bad nerve damage, terrible nausea and vomiting. If you look at that, the point system, if you had a very low number of points, and I should go back and show you here all the scoring system that was developed. Um, so any of you can do this, you know, we could teach you to do this. Your chances of getting serious toxicity were at like 25%, one in four. If you had a high point, it was 90%. So you might be able to 
talk with a patient about a drug and kind of tell them what they're in for. Now, this is a study. It had 500 people, and you think that's a lot. But there were all kinds of patients. So we don't know if you're getting Herceptin, you know, what this, but we're working on it. So we're trying to capture these data on specific drugs in specific patient groups. So if you come in, and you know, it's, it, we're interested in older people, but I'm sure this is true in younger people. I'm sure if you're 50 and you can't walk a block, that you've got the same problem um, as someone 70. Um, but as, as Trev eloquently put, it's really a health assessment. Uh, but we, we needed grant funding, so we got a lot right, Jerry. Yeah, just. <laughs> now, this Karnofsky status, which has been around for years, Dr. Karnofsky kind of categorized patients. Performance status zero means you were fine, and if you had a performance status like one or two, you were up most of the day, but you had symptoms from your cancer, and if you were three or four, you were sick. You were in bed most of the day. So we've used that like almost biblically to define where patients are in their treatment. And you can see, using that to predict toxicity, um, 100 means you're fine, and people in 70 or less than 70 are sicker, it's kind of worthless, right? You might as well just say to the patient, it's 50-50, because that's where you are. <laughs> so um, we, we're trying to get these tools to predict side effects in older people. Because if we take it and make it so you can't walk a block, and, and you're not going to really do better in the long run with your chemotherapy, maybe that treatment is not for you. And we need to know that. So when usually you take care of old people, um, especially sicker older people, their families are in there. The daughters usually, but it can be the whole thing. And these are the questions they ask. Now, it's interesting. It's always the family that wants more aggressive treatment. When you ask the patients, they're, they're not always the same. Um, um, but uh, it's very important that you have accurate information that people can process. Um, and then and just to end here, um, we did a trial in the uh, Alliance and CLGB, and, 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 and I, I, I call out Patty, but Patty's been a great advocate and been involved in helping us get these trials out to the public. And what we did was we looked at some of our top institutions in the United States. These are the flagship academic medical centers. And what we knew was every one of these centers had a trial open that an older people could get on. Um, so we looked, and if you were less than 65, only half the patients were still offered the trial. For a whole host of biases and reasons, um, people were not offered the trial, even though it was sitting right at UNC or Duke, wherever, wherever it was. If, if, if they were older, and we adjusted this for your age, your race, your comorbidity, stage, education, if just your age alone, you said, I'm 66, 15% 15, uh, 15 drop in offering trials. So terrific age bias. Th this is not community. I'm not picking on my friends you know, who are working so hard in the community. This is us. This is us. And then if you offer to trials, though, look what happened. It's very similar. There's really no d meaningful difference. The older people were just as willing to go on the trials as the younger people if they were offered them. So that's important. And then the last thing that I think is very germane to all of you is we did this trial, um, and this is 1986. Uh, in CLGB. I think it's one of the best trials ever done, and it's not widely publicized. So here's the trial. You have metastatic breast cancer, and we offer you standard chemotherapy, which that time was a CAF, very potent. Some of you had cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, 5-FU. Very popular at the time. Very aggressive chemotherapy. Lots of side effects. The best we had. This is before taxanes, etc. So you're randomized to get this, or, and we barely got this through all these IRBs, we're going to start you on a new treatment, a new drug not tested in breast cancer. So it's a new drug that we know the dose, because there's things called phase one trials, and phase one trials are really dose-finding studies. Now, we're always hoping to shrink tumors, but by definition, we're trying to find a safe dose, and then when we have it, we check breast cancer and colon cancer and everything else to see how good the drug is. So the first thing was the new drug and then go to the 
um, go back to standard therapy. Because we wanted to find out, is it safe to look at brand new drugs in the early setting? Are we putting uh, women who have a serious problems, lives at risk, by not offering them standard therapy up front? Okay? And so what happened here was, if you look, there's over 300 patients in this study, um, and there's a whole host of new drugs. Some of these drugs were, didn't really work very well. But there was really no difference in the average overall survival. This two-month difference is not statistically meaningful. These, these numbers are not meaningful. And a few of the drugs, this is uh, trimetrexate, which didn't turn out to be very good in breast cancer, but is widely used in lung cancer, um, and a modified, a drug that looked really good. Um, we saw actually very good response rates. And here, the partial response rate to this was better than our best chemo. And if anything, the overall survival looked a little bit better. They're not meaningful differences. The point was, it is very safe if you're offered a clinical trial early on to go on it. Um, to, this is randomized data. Now, if you have a metastatic breast cancer and, you're an older, and there's really a good standard therapy um, and it's well-defined, sure, I would take it too. But if you've had treatment and it's not doing well and you have an opportunity to go on a clinical trial, um, I believe you're not compromising yourself. You know, we can always go back and give you Taxol or Aribulin or whatever we've got, but I think the healthier you are, if you, if you can do it, and it's not always easy to do it, especially in older people, you should think of doing it. Um, and you're not putting your lives at risk. So to end up, this is how we're designing trials now in our group. Let's say you have metastatic breast cancer any performance status, because we don't want to exclude people who are frail or vulnerable. Why? They go out and someone treats them anyway, and we don't learn how well they do. So we want them in the trial. So, and you and patient define a treatment, and what Trev and I do is we look at geriatric assessment, quality of life, we look at the toxicity. This is common toxicity criteria, so we look at nausea, all the basic stuff. And then this is patient-reported toxicity. So that's very hot now. You know, I may say, that patient's really doing well with this. And the patient says, please, I'm <laughs> doing terribly with this. And sometimes it's the other way around, surprisingly. Sometimes we look at someone and, you know, we, we say, oh, they're doing, they look so fatigued. And, and they say, I'm, I'm fine with it. So it's not always intuitive. And then things like promise, which is a wonderful type of uh, quality of life stuff, look, looks at fatigue, looks at... Uh, other issues in your life that the chemotherapy may affect, and biomarkers of aging. And so what we're interested in is looking at function and quality of life. You know, we know that a lot of these studies have shown that the tumor shrinks a specific percentage of time. But the problem is, almost none of these studies have large amounts of older people. So there's always little warnings in the package. It says, this drug has not been tested in older adults. Right? It's like this drug has not been tested in pregnancy because they don't have a clue, and, but they're not going to take any risk. So what we like to do, and, and, and for, there's a lot of good people in pharma. There's a lot of, you know, we want to convince them, like they have in children, that if they test a drug in 70-year-olds that looks good in 50-year-olds, that they can have a specific exemption and get a patent for a year longer. So if they put that money in the research and take a risk, they'll do better because we've learned in, especially in colorectal cancer and other things, certain drugs are very damaging uh, to older patients where we didn't see it in younger patients. So it's very important to know that. Uh, and so in older people, um, it's the cancer stage, age, and the treatment. Um, it's your comorbidities, coexisting illnesses, especially those that are going to shorten your life, bad COPD, diabetes, heart failure, um, your organ function. And then there's a lot of stuff, your, function, your functional status, your social support. Who's going to bring you in for the clinical trial? Um, and all these other issues that Trevor did and finances, major thing for a lot of this um, uh, issues. And then finally, your cultural values. Uh, people look at trials much differently. Spirituality, uh, very important. You know, what are your personal beliefs? Uh, and literacy. There, there are a lot of people who, especially older people, who don't really understand a randomized trial. Um, very, very complicated and scary. So um, 
I'm going to end there. And um, thank you very much. And we've, we've talked a lot. stable and do you look pretty good to me from here yeah. <laughs> I don't know you that well um, and, and you know you came to this meeting and that means a lot because uh, that tells us a lot about people who came here um, um, if you're st you know I don't know a thing about you uh, but um, if you're stable and you're feeling well and your current treatment isn't get, giving you cumulative side effects I'd stay there I'd stay there but I would Talk with my doctors, and you know you, you, you don't want to look for bad things. Mm -hmm. But to say if this tumor starts growing again, you know I would be very interested in what clinical trials are available. And there is a great website, you know, called you know on, on the National Cancer Institute, uh, PDQ, and you can look up trials. And I'll tell you, there are thousands of them, and no doctor knows them all. I don't care where you go; you got to be your own advocate. And you can put in and get a lot of help. And I tell people to look for me. Just like alternative medicine, all these herbs and everything, I don't know them all. But there are very good websites where people can go up and look and see, what's the science? Has anybody looked at curcumin and a uh, certain drug or something and really get the lowdown? So my advice to anybody like you would be, if you're in good shape, and you know, I'd stay the course, but I would tell my doctors, that I'm interested in trials because that might prompt uh, a doctor to send you to a major medical center earlier. Um, you know, put he or she on alert, and I think it's a good thing. But I wouldn't change if your life is good and everything is hanging in there. Okay, you said that you identified yourself as a geriatric oncologist. Okay. He's the real one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see any age, you know, um, I'm one of our breast cancer group with Dr. Carey, Dr. Dees, I think we have a terrific group, as many of you have terrific doctors all over the country, but our major interest in life now is to look at issues in older patients. Trev and I are in breast cancer, but we have a big program, we're interested in head and neck cancer and whole, you know, all people, and, and, and we have lots of uh, issues with metastatic disease and other sites. But we really are focusing on the breast cancer. And so, we would like to actually get some of these drug studies for some of these new drugs and look at them in older people and look at the toxicities and how they do. So some of the issues that we identify are like comorbidities that fall, they're the same across the cancer spectrum. So yeah. breast cancer, lung cancer, they all have some and surprisingly, you know, if you're doing very well with your metastatic breast cancer, you're one of those fortunate people to have a long remission on a therapy, and you're getting older, and you fall in your house once, and um, maybe you didn't hurt yourself the first time, you're at risk for really falling and breaking your hip, and that's going to be a greater problem than your metastases. There are studies in women with metastatic breast cancer, 70 and above, huge studies in Sears, where as many as a quarter of those patients ultimately passed of non-breast cancer causes. So it's very, very important to address them. It might not be appropriate for someone very sick, but in someone who's doing pretty well to neglect falls or find out they have no social support at home, no, no one ever comes to visit them, um, or they uh, don't know how to, they can't open a jar or get proper PTOT, it's very, very important to take that on. Or on any too many meds, three antidepressants, we see it all the time. Uh, on your team, are there people who do home visits uh, or home assessments? We're working very hard to do. We're, 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 we're actually looking for some grant funding 
to get there's a, there's a great study that showed if you have an older person and a sick older person these were post-operative patients and you send them home with our usual discharge day planning we give you 10,000 sheets of paper and we don't even know if you can afford your meds when you show up at CVS that's standard of care everywhere versus a group of older patients where a uh, geriatric nurse, nurse practitioner, nurse with one visit, one, one call, visit call. and a few calls, reduced, improved survival over the year, and certainly improved quality of life. And these people went out to the house and they did more than check you. They said, you know, look, look at your house. You've got all these wires across the floor and you're hoarding all these magazines. <laughs> Seriously. And they made your life better. They made your life better. happens is I get pulled in the hall and, and the door says we want everything done for mom. Now everything doesn't always mean chemo, you know, it's like, in, and, and it's very good to get, to get everybody in the same room and to have mom look the family in the eye and say, you know, I'm not really sure that's what I want. And so you want, everybody hears the same conversation because mom is the boss. Yeah, right, because the family Exactly. The family's afraid they're guilty that they haven't done everything for mom, which I would be too. And the patient hears that this drug may prolong their life three months, is going to mean lots of visits to the clinic and potential for toxicity. And she says, I don't want it. And everybody has to hear that in the same venue. It can't be, they tell you, you go in the hall, to, you know, I've learned, just bring it there, and it usually works itself out. It really does, because if, if the person, you know, obviously has to be cognitively aware of the issues, but if they are, it really puts people at peace, because I think you alleviate the guilt of the family for not doing everything for their loved one, and for hearing the person's choices uh, for what they want done. Advanced directives. Mm -hmm. have them. Uh, Halbo cyclic. Halbo, as we call Halbo. Halbo. So compassionate use means they have really good data. So they allow certain centers to take care, to give that drug to patients who would have met the trial criteria. And that's very good. The problem is, it's very hard to do is it in reality, because when they do that, when we do the trial, we get reimbursed. But when we put the patients on for compassionate use, we have to follow the same safety and other guidelines. Now, we do do it for selected drugs, um, because we want to do the best for our patients. So it means it might be available. You frequently have to shop around, and Pfizer may know. And, and it's a, it, it, the company, you know, they get a lot of hits, and pharma needs some help, and we all do, but they, they will try to help out and perhaps can tell you where these things are. I actually think it will be approved, it, unless there's some, uh, I haven't personally reviewed the, the data, but the FDA is very good. Understaffed, very good. And uh, between them and their review, when they look at it, uh, I think that this drug is going to come out quickly. And we're all excited uh, about the data. Um, it really looks nice, and the nice thing about this drug to date is it doesn't look very toxic, unlike uh, a finitor.